Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 198. This episode is the fourth appearance of one of my favorite people in the whole world, Tom Wilton. It's been almost three years since the last time he was on the show, and honestly, it feels like we live in a totally different world. In this episode, we talk about him working after quarantine, climbing inside an iguanodon under Jurassic World Dominion, the different novels he's been writing, getting the role of Ceres in Willow, what that process was like putting the prosthetics on, sword fighting Christian Slater, the importance of never giving up, and so much more. I am so excited to have him back on the show, and you are all in for a treat. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. Please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 198, with Tom Wilton. Theme song time. You're so handsome. How you doing, buddy? Look at you. You're so handsome. <laughs> Stop it. It's the glasses. <laughs> I, know, I know. Likewise. Likewise. Yeah. I uh, can't see anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that little that little thing. Yeah. Just a thing called um, aging. It's, uh, it's, it's all the rage I've heard. <laughs> tell, tell me about it. <laughs> it's, it's happening fast. <laughs> I got to get that. I got I to get that. The little Mr. Fantastic gray lines on the sides the silver foxiness <laughs> yeah we were talking about this at work the other day it's that thing of um yeah when we when we started when we first started doing the star wars stuff you know yeah i wasn't gray Derek wasn't <laughs> gray you know and now we're, now we're just like aging <laughs> gracefully and yeah 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 you know what so i actually i looked it up this morning because i was like how long has it been do you know when the 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 last time you were on the show was oh um so we did mm -hmm. we did that we did that fantastic kind of samurai japanese that's but, right but was that for was that for the interesting or was that for something else that was the hype show that was different yeah, yeah. see that's what that's when it gets tricky because you and i we still talk all the time so it's like yeah it's not yeah like i exactly. haven't talked to you in forever no yeah yeah so I, so was the last time was it was it with um was it with Derek? Was it, it was with, it was so we did it a was. joint it was it was both of your third appearance, but Derek was did it? a four. Derek did he did a fourth. This yeah, is your yeah, fourth. Yeah, I thought, I thought he did. I thought he did. <laughs> that was Cheap. April fourteenth, twenty twenty. Seriously, been almost three years. Yeah, uh, isn't that wild? April twenty. Well, no, uh, April twenty twenty. Yeah, April fourteenth of twenty twenty was the joint appearance of you two. So we were. The world had just shut down. Yeah. I was yeah. going to say we were we were just in we literally just in the um oh my word right so that would be so all that stuff that we probably couldn't have said to you at yeah the time. <laughs> yeah so that would yeah so literally that would have been just after uh so I was I was coordinating the puppetry on the third Fantastic Beasts film uh huh at that point and we had we had. Uh, we'd heard like rumors. So this was going back, uh, you know, a couple of weeks before we would have spoken. Mm -hmm. we, we were sort of, you know, suddenly, obviously, you know, there was like, oh, this is virus and okay, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's in Venice. And I, I seem to remember that, you know, the Mission Impossible were having mm -hmm. problems. They were trying to shoot in, in Venice. And then, and then we got rumors because um, Robin Guyver was attached. He was looking after the puppetry on The Little Mermaid. Right. Uh, so at Leaveston Film Studios, where we were shooting Fantastic Beasts, on the Friday, we were suddenly, everyone was kind of hearing rumours that The Little Mermaid had shut down. And everyone was kind of going, oh, ooh, oh no, does this mean that, you know, and at the time, you know, people were talking about maybe like a two week hiatus or, oh, or yeah. something like that. <laughs> That's it. That's all we and... need. <laughs> Uh, yeah right that's the yeah yeah and it was past like, us hey, two, two weeks it should, that'll be enough to let this yeah. little thing blow, just blow let it over. fizzle out right <laughs> it's gonna and then uh yeah and we were we were 
we were sort of throwing sort of you know i you know hypothesis around you know ideas around in the back of the vfx truck about like you know uh if if we would you know if if we came in on monday you know would they make an announcement or something like that uh one of the one of the team was like well i think they might bring us in just to you know just so that they can say that we've started principal yeah that's right because monday Mm -hmm. we hadn't even started principal photography so monday was going to be the first day of principal photography and someone was like well they'll probably bring us in just so they can say they've started principal photography and sure. then maybe it's on hiatus. So there's like, there's an insurance kind of factor there. And then on Sunday night, quite late, I got a call from the production manager saying, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're shutting down and, and we don't know for how long. Yeah. Um, so we're going to, so we're going to carry on paying you for a couple of weeks, which was fantastic. There you go. But, but at that point, um, you know, we're going to terminate, everyone's contracts and no. and so and then it was just like okay and then and obviously and then the world fell apart and it was like wow yeah, yeah. Up, like, literally a couple of weeks so i t- i can't really remember the conversation that we had then but if Me i was right with anxiety <laughs> if yeah. i seemed as though i was like oh my goodness that that might be why yeah, yeah. <laughs> wondering whether i was going to have a job any kind of job to come back to after right. the world um, you know that was three years ago. I don't remember either. <laughs> they can go listen to it. That's recorded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh my God. So, dude, so much has happened because this was even before Dominion because you guys yeah. shut down Dominion yeah. for a while and then you had to come back for it. It, it. That's it because Dominion, Dominion was the first thing that started up after, after that, that break. Yeah. So, yeah. So Derek, um, yeah, Derek must've been, Derek must've been attached to, Jurassic by that point he was yeah I'm sure he was he was pretty he early been, on yeah he must have been attached to Jurassic by that point so uh yeah so Jurassic was the first thing that went back um and it was it was bonkers as well because he might have told you this but uh the first thing that we were due to shoot as a kind of team on that was this huge uh commitment in regards to puppetry for this for the market sequence oh, the best scene in the whole movie you I mean come on <laughs> come on i mean i'm a little biased but also a little bit a lot of bit yeah just yeah. A little, yeah yeah <laughs> um yeah so we were so we were due to shoot that and we you know we were all thinking hey this is this is all going to end up going to vfx you know there's no there's no way that they're going to bring in there's no way, given how anxious everyone was, particularly the COVID teams. Sure. There's no, there's no way that they're going to bring. Because I mean, like to give you an example, we had like a, a like a, a viral specialist. Nice. Consult well on all aspects of how we could start a third Fantastic Beasts film up again. Mm-hmm. But I ended up having a meeting about what my team, my puppeteers, could wear on set. That would oh. allow them to do their jobs, but be be within two meters of the the main stars. Sure, which are interacting with the thing you're doing. Yeah. So, so in the end, I was I was like I was like negotiating. Well, look, what can we? And, and in the end, we agreed. We <laughs> we looked like we looked like um, puppetry's answer to Seal Team Six. We had these, <laughs> we had these goggles, these like ski goggles, and then we could have our, our our hoods, our black hoods, pulled right down, like almost underneath the the top of the ski goggles, and then we would have like a KN95 mask, mm-hmm. and then obviously a black a black snood kind of pulled up <laughs> over, over that. So essentially, because essentially she said, "Look, you know, you, you can't have any." You can't have any um, part of your skin showing, right? Uh, so not your eyes, or because essentially you're going to be puppeteering at a lower level than these actors, and you know when, when they're talking, if any spittle comes out of their mouth and accidentally hits oh. your face, or your eye, or goes in your mouth, then then you could potentially catch COVID. So yeah, so we had this really you know like in depth kind of like breakdown of what we could wear as part and also like really stringent like um cleaning protocols like for instance if i had one of the vfx reference puppets 
Um, and, you know, in one bit of the scene, it's it's moving around independently, but then the actor has to hold it, like one of the nifflers or the, or the baby sure. chimney I spent most of the time puppeteering. Cool. And there was this whole thing about like um, having to kind of like wipe them down with antiviral wipes and things like that before they got handed over to the actors. Yeah. Like there was all of this kind of stuff that was kind of going on. So when Jurassic were like, hey, let's get 20 puppeteers in and like get them <laughs> like, you know, all stuffed around, you know, like, I mean, I, honestly, Brian, I think half, the, I don't think I, I'm not entirely sure if anyone really knew the extent to how close some of the puppeteers were working on that because a lot of the time it was it was a little bit of out of sight out of mind because you know in, in the boxes and things you know where the puppeteers were working because you couldn't see them because it was all dressed it was dressed to kind of hide the pu puppeteers ah, sure classic i'm not entirely sure that that they knew that there were you know like <laughs> five puppeteers like literally like cheek to cheek like this is not this can't be right for covid you know right. it's uh, <laughs> we're in this together guys <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. Brought, you bring you take a breath and i'll take a breath you know? yes not in each other's mouths we talked about yeah, this no no <laughs> um so yeah it was so yeah it was bonkers it was bonkers that that was the first thing that we started back with um yeah we were sure that they weren't gonna let us do it but uh but they did what's more claustrophobic putting all that stuff on or going up in iguanodon <laughs> oh wow <laughs> Derek told that me. Was, um, yeah, that was pretty. <laughs> that was pretty. Um, yeah, I think you know what it was. It was. It was the. It was the fact that you had to. You kind of. You. I was. I was on like a board. So I'd lay on the board, and then they would have to kind of slide me in <laughs> inside it. So there was. Tell that, me, there's a video somewhere. I really hope. Come really on. Hard. Maybe there's some behind the scenes somewhere. Yes. I did. See, I did see a picture actually. I did. Um, oh. I wonder if I can find it for you. You know what I it's did. like to play an enema now. Well done. <laughs> hey, listen, we we already we already look. You know, Derek and I climbing in and in out the backside of a polar bear. We're, we're, yeah. we're already kind of we already had a sort of a, a, a fairly uh, fairly good idea of that. That's what you do for a living. That's I know. Isn't that stupid? Do you ever think about that? Isn't that silly? Isn't that silly? That's what I do for a living. There was really not a lot of room. I mean, I I think yeah, those are my. You probably can't see in the picture, but those. are my my feet are basically sticking oh, out. Oh yeah. So there really wasn't a lot of room getting getting in and out. Um it was it was a bit claustrophobic that one. Wow. What a time to be alive. I know what a time to be alive. <laughs> did you volunteer for that or did you guys draw straws and it goes, Tom, Tom will get in there? I think Derek just just put me in it, didn't he? That sounds about uh, right. <laughs> I know. Who, I know. Mm, who who can I who can I torture with this one? Uh, I know the perfect man for this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, you should make a you should make a list one day of creatures that you've like crawled into. Yes, you know I bet it's extensive. It's yeah, probably more than we I think. think probably yeah, no, it probably is. It probably is. Wait, hold on, polar bear, midnight sky polar bear. No. Okay. No, the polar bear. No, the polar bear for Derek and I goes right back to. It was kind of just after. I think it was just after the Force Awakens, and mm -hmm. there was a Sky TV show called fortitude aptly named yeah and it was set <laughs> uh, so it wasn't it didn't actually wasn't it didn't feature in the series but this pr company taylor herring who were looking after the pr for it did this absolutely amazing job of selling the show i mean like on the day that it came out in london you you couldn't you couldn't move for advertisements for the uh for the series i believe it was the first series that sky finance themselves that they they put their own money into oh, the tv wow. and so the stunt was that they would millennium fx were going to build this two-person park there oh. and derek and i were going to take it we're not you know not by ourselves but with the <laughs> team and then taylor herring we took it to strategic points around london and then filmed filmed us kind of walking around in it um uh, and it was a really successful really successful marketing campaign taylor herring won they won like awards for it, and um, wow! And like we've done jobs. I did. A job, I did a job a few years ago, where they where they were where they were like, yeah, okay, so this is the kind of this is the kind of vibe that that we're that we're going for. You know, we want to make it like this campaign, and uh, we've got some footage of a person speaking that we'd like you to watch as an idea of of kind of what we want. And they they showed me footage of of me speaking on, on the Fortitude, <laughs> and I was like, 
did you not did you not put two and two together like <laughs> stand next to the me. screen that's uh... that's me you want me so i i think i could do that i think i can i think i can do me you know like yeah yeah i'm the guy <laughs> Both yeah, literally like, and figuratively. <laughs> yeah, that was a funny one. But yeah, it was that successful that then, you know, subsequent PR companies were kind of copying it, you know, endlessly. But um Wow. Yeah, that was that was quite a that was quite a tight one to get in and out of. Um Whew. yeah. How did that mechanically work? Like you did front half, he did back half, like yes, That's right. Although okay. since then, actually since then, Derek and I have done quite a few polar bears since built around a similar kind of design and we 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 change around now we, we kind of really how do you yeah. like the back half <laughs> it's 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 much easier <laughs> really <laughs> don't tell derek i said that i won't i won't much, he doesn't listen to these don't worry it's much easier <laughs> to listen he's, he's a recluse these days yeah i've heard he's he's turning into neil you have to yeah. go through us through an assistant via pigeon yes. like he I is get it I get it. He is, isn't he? He is. Not for real, dude. Could not be happier. I'm like, yeah, look at you. You had to be the butt of so many animals, and now look at you. You're the head of departments. Honestly, it is great. It's great, Brian. I'm so, I'm so, honestly, I'm not, I know that he's not, <laughs> I know I didn't make him, but I'm so, <laughs> but I'm so proud. I'm so proud of him. I think he's really, Same. it's really extraordinary what he's done. And it, and I, you know, I think it's, um, and also he's, he's doing a fantastic job as well. Yeah. Because it's it's it you you are you it's it's a it's a very careful balancing act that he's doing you know between mm -hmm. you know, even even just within the creature effects department there's something like there's something like nine de departments within creature effects so liaising between all of those and then the on set work basically being the bridge between those those two worlds and oh. then and then also obviously booking and managing all of the um, creature performers and puppeteers yeah it's a different brain yeah just to have that i think about that uh, whenever i talk to other directors and stuff i'm like that's just i'm gonna focus on my little tiny part and that's what i got directors to be like all those yeah. things like my brain just doesn't doesn't work that way yeah it's too many plates yeah and he's killing it he's killing it he is it's great and i think and also i think he's um i mean you know it's hard work it's hard, hard yeah. work but i think it's really satisfying as well um yeah and I think he's he you know I think he is enjoying he's enjoying the work as well which isn't which is important you know oh yeah that's what leads to the longevity if you don't you will burn out yeah probably quickly yeah you Oof. you know with this with this filming game it's um it's a lot it's a lot you know you have to you got to pace yourself with it I think that's something that that's something the pandemic taught me actually that was a really useful that was that was kind of, really yeah because you know, for the first time, I don't know about you, but for the for the first time in as long as I could remember, I wasn't doing anything during that first lockdown. I wasn't doing anything, but then but no, neither was anybody else. And that was a difference because prior to that, you know, you, you know, if you took a break or something in the back of my mind, I was always aware that, other, you know, other projects were going on and you're your head's going mm -hmm. okay, you gotta think about you know uh there's this thing that's coming up and oh i really want to get on this show so who do i have to talk to and there's all of that kind of going on or maybe you know yeah, that green eyed monster comes out and you hear about somebody that's doing something and you're like oh i really wish i was doing that and uh-huh and right you know mm -hmm. and none of that none of that was happening it was like it was a it was a guilt free break and i don't and I, you know i don't mean to light of what happened during that time because it was a you know it was an awful time for many many people totally um, but in regards to that aspect i mean there was lots of other you know um, there was lots of other anxiety about all sorts of other things that was going on but but for but in that specific way it was um it was i, I noticed that it's actually very good for my mental health because i didn't yeah I wasn't able to sort of worry about those things um it's like a professional mental reset yeah it was wasn't it yeah like just kind of, you know, wiping the desk clean and, and and starting again. And I've tried since to, I've tried since, I've not always been successful, but I've, I'm trying <laughs> to be, to be better. That's all it takes. Better, right? At least, at, least, no, at least I'm trying. You just got to try. Just, just that, <laughs> to get that work life, that work life balance a bit, a bit better. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, I think I, I hit that, that lockdown, that first lockdown. And I, I you know, we'd gone straight from, Wow, what what what, what are we? It was something that we were doing before Christmas, but I'd gone. That's right. Yes, it was the midnight sky, which I loved, by the way. Oh, did you good? I did. You surprised me. 
because I was watching the credits and I saw your name. I was like, whoa, what? Hold on. And I texted you. I was like, you worked on this? Yeah. And we were I really Jack liked and I it. Were high up in those credits as well. We were like, we were just yeah. after the stunties. We were like, what? And then we were da- we were down on the call sheet as um it was a weird one because we were technically we were kind of working under the auspices of the stunt department on that one. So oh. on the call sheet, we were down as stunt puppeteers. <laughs> there you go. Double like, dipping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, you uh, know. No I'm a stunt, can. I'm a stunt puppeteer now these days. Uh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Take those titles where you can get them. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but we, uh, uh, there was much more of a commitment after Christmas than there was supposed to be. And I had been banking on there being a bit of time off ah, uh, sure. between between finishing that job and starting the third Fantastic Beast 3, which I knew was going to be very involved because of my role in the department. And right. you know, I, I knew it was going to be a, 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 you know, a big responsibility. So I was, I was, I felt like I kind of needed a bit of a break. And sure. then for some reason, the Midnight Sky just ran, it ran over. So, um, so I think I kind of went straight from the Midnight Sky on to, beasts three and i definitely remember feeling like you know tired like close to like close to burnout like so sure in in, in, in you know it's funny isn't it the way the world works and then suddenly mm-hmm. everything stopped now those those you know jurassic park's pretty cool fantastic beast pretty cool yeah yeah. how's yeah. the elf lock coming ah uh, yeah hey look, i'm glad you've asked me about that because i i it's, it's, it's like the, top of my list. Well, listen, I wanted to, yeah, you see, see, we should talk about writing. I thought it'd be really good to talk about some writing. Too yeah, let's because, do it. Because I've, I've, it's it's really funny you asked that actually, because just today I, I was pushing myself to, when I lose focus or I lose the energy behind writing, sure. I tend to try and jumpstart that again by listening to podcasts on writing. Ah, there you go. I find really helpful. So I listen. I listened to one today uh, that I saw recommended through Twitter through an author who, through a sort of writing support group, she had critiqued. I think the first three chapters on something that I'd written. Anyway, so I follow her, and so she and she was recommending this 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 podcast, the Writer's Routine. And essentially, what this guy does is he interviews writers about what their what their daily routine is. Which, cool. uh, you know, like, yeah, it's cool. Like, it seems I'm about it. Like, like on paper, that sounds like that would be pretty mundane, you know. Like, <laughs> actually, if you're a writer, it's it is cool because you kind of you listen, you go, oh, that's interesting. So those are the kind of things that you're, the challenges that you're dealing with on a day to day basis. And yeah. Anyway, for me, listening to stuff like that helps helps kind of get me back into it because I've been feeling, yeah, I've, I've so, I mean, I've written again the. Talking of writing, the or talking of the pandemic and writing, um, I wrote, I wrote two, uh, two middle grade novels. What on that during that first lockdown? Like, dude, it, it was incredibly pro- productive for me in that. Yeah. So since Elflock, so Elflock is my was Elflock my s- second completed middle grade manuscript i think it is so elf lock i think was my second so since then uh one two three four i've, I've written four maybe possibly four or five maybe five more dude uh, manuscripts the last one i wrote relatively recently one of those is within the world of elf lock except cool. it's set many many years in the future and the, my current whip my current work in progress that i'm kind of drafting out the synopsis for now is 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 like the sequel to elf lock so it follows on it follows on from from that book but i i'm in this place now where i've written i've completed quite a lot of manuscripts yeah i have yet had any major literary agent interest in any of them although i got very close actually the the pandemic year Uh uh-huh very close. I had a had a really productive meeting with a literary agent called Hannah Shepherd. But anyway, essentially, I've got a number of different stories now, and I feel like some of them are at that stage where it's like you put it in the bottom drawer and you move on. But others, I I think, still have a great deal of potential, and they're in various different stages of kind of redrafting. And okay, honestly, I feel a bit 
lost in it all. And sure, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what, what's the best way to move forwards because I've kind of, yeah, I've, I've kind of lost some of the, I think, I think there's a bit of fatigue. I think there's a bit of sure. fatigue there for me in regards to that feeling, that, that, that excited feeling of having that idea. Mm-hmm. And I, and I'm quite good about drafting these things. I will, I will have a, what I consider to be quite a, quite a, fairly solid synopsis before before I go on to write the thing. And then you go through those varying stages. And you know this as a writer, you you know, you think what you've written at times you're like, oh yeah. Okay. I, I think <laughs> oh, yeah. I think this might be the best thing that I've ever written. You know? Oh yeah. And then you come back to it and you're like, this is terrible. This is the <laughs> worst thing anybody's <laughs> ever written, you know. And so oh, yeah. And I've gone through that cycle so many times and I've kind of got to that point where it kind of feels like, oh, I've almost got a literary agent and oh, you know, and, I, and I, sometimes I get, you know, really good responses from things and it's, and, and it feels like I'm moving in the right direction. But I, yeah, I just, I feel a bit, um, I feel a bit lost with it all at the moment. What do you find to be more vulnerable? Cause I had a realization this week where yeah. I found that I, if I write something and I give it to someone to read, I feel way more vulnerable than any performance I've ever given. Yeah. I don't know what that is. Do you feel yeah, the same a, way? Yeah. Yeah. I writing? Thought, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, I think, yes, I think, I think I, I do. Although there, although I think there are times, there are times, aren't there, with acting where you can, you can feel very vulnerable if you are not in an environment which is supportive. Oh, for sure. You know, so that it, it's, yeah. Did I ever tell you about, did I tell you about like when I, when I kind of like when I kind of gave up, no, I kind of gave up acting. I kind of, I did I, you? I sort of, well, okay, talk to me. So it was like it. it yeah. <laughs> I'm <laughs> I'm occasionally I'm occasionally reminded of this job that I that I did. So in Belfast, okay, in the Titanic Museum uh-huh. in Belfast. How all great stories start. Right. <laughs> and believe me, my performance was like the Titanic sinking. Um, <laughs> uh, there is a Pepper's Ghost projection. There's a Pepper's Ghost projection of me playing. What? <laughs> playing, really? Yes. Playing a steward on the Titanic. And uh, it was written by a guy who i who i think cura- curates kind of museum exhibitions mm. but is 100 percent not a writer <laughs> and the thing about the thing about the challenge was that because of the nature of the pepper's ghost and the fact that they were going to be moving they were physically in the room there were going to be props that were going to move mm-hmm. in sync with my projection aha uh-huh. So they said to me, we have to do, it has to be a continuous take. We can't, mm. we can't chop, we can't chop and change this thing. And it was four or five solid A4 pages of some of the densest and hardest stuff that I've ever had to learn because it was very, it was, forgive me, I don't want to offend this guy. I can't remember his name and he what he was the other day and, and actually, he didn't make he didn't make it much easier. So, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna have too much lose much sleep over this. But right. it was that kind of it was that kind of amateur writing that is very repetitive. So mm-hmm. that as an actor inside that writing, you get lost very easily because sure. you're saying something and you're like it, it it tricks your brain because you go I've said this before oh my goodness am i am i have i gone back on myself and then you realize that actually you haven't it's just that something has been written which is very similar but not exactly the same as something that you've already said and so sure. so it's stuff like that which just made it really really hard to learn and what was worse was that it, it just it kept being changed right up until the last oh, no. so i had to get a train up to york in the north of england and I'd had a I'd had a change of I had you know a, a change of script that day or, or the day before oh. so on the on the journey up on the train I was I was kind of you know busy kind of trying to you know get my head around these changes, and then I arrived at about I don't know I got into the hotel I think at about nine o'clock that night and we were due to you know get started early the next day, and I got another change 
when I arrived oh. at the hotel. So then, so then again, I was trying to wrap my head around this new bit of dialogue that was that was in there, and and um, and honestly, I didn't feel prepared. I, bet. I knew that it had to be done in one go, and I just didn't feel prepared. And then we got in there. And they stuck this really stupid fake moustache on my <laughs> on my face, <laughs> and then I went into this studio, and and honestly, honestly, Brian, it was I it was one of, if not the worst sort of day professionally I, I've I've ever had. Oof! I just could not get to the end of this damn thing without slipping up. And what happened as the pressure as the pressure built, I would get so close to fin to doing one complete pass on this thing and then my brain would jump in a couple of lines before the end and be like hey i think you've done it you've done it and then as soon as my brain had thought that oh, blah, 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 i'd stumble i'd stumble on a word <laughs> and, I, and right back to the beginning and, and this was going on and on and we just you know and it felt it felt like we were never ever gonna get a complete clean sort of you know oh. and yeah, that, the, the guy that wrote it was there, and he was giving direction, which wasn't very helpful. And 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 the more the more that I made mistakes, the more that I began to fall apart. And it was this kind of horrible kind of oh yeah kind of whirlpool, which was all kind of going in on itself. And I was losing confidence, and they were looking kind of distraught because you know they were thinking, oh god, are we are we are we ever going to get this? And you don't know what you don't know. Facts. Till you know different. Fast forward, fast forward to an absolutely delightful day that I spent with an absolutely wonderful team doing bits to camera for the Warner Brothers Tokyo edition oh. of the Warner Brothers tour in London. So they're building, they're doing a whole, they're, they're basically recreating, you know, this this fantastically successful, you know, studio tour thing for Harry Potter. In, uh -huh. in in Tokyo, but they're adding some new stuff in and, and some of that new content is Beast's content. Oh, cool. So I had this absolutely fantastic day working with this team because they had the technology to support what we were doing. So I was working from an auto queue. Oh, dude. And it, I look back and I think, I look back and, I think, you know, because I must have, you know, <laughs> they must have known the existence of auto queues. <laughs> I think I knew the existence of auto queues, but I think, I don't know, there was, some, I mean, that would have... I mean, I would have, I would have been in and out of there in, in, in like, <laughs> yeah. I just, just, I just would have read it from the screen, and it, we, we, we would have got it, and it wouldn't have been, and it would not have ended up being such a traumatic day. And we, anyway, somehow we got to the end of that day, and one of the guys that was, you know, running the studio, who was very nice, he drove me back to the station to get to get my train back to London, and he could see, he could see how absolutely crushed I was. And he sort of, you know, as he pulled, as we pulled up the station, he was like, he was like, well done. He was like, that was a really, that was a really tough day. And I can see that it's, that it's, you know, that it's taken its toll on you. And I was like, thank you. And he sort of, he pulled out this 20 quid note and he went, look, get yourself a couple of gin and tonics for the train home. <laughs> <laughs> and I sat on the train home drinking these gin and tonics, feeling absolutely miserable. Um, yeah. And I, and I, I called my then agent the next day and i said i said don't put me up for any more acting stuff i don't want to do it really what got you back in the saddle then so i think well i think it was probably it was probably aftab actually really it's probably aftab because wow because jj uh you know when we work with the animatronic heads sometimes you know that they will want the uh the facial puppeteer to right to, do i mean obviously on the day when we're filming it it's always a facial puppeteer who is delivering the lines mm -hmm. but in the rehearsals it, it sometimes it can depend and actually it felt because uh, i was working with the with the wonderful patrick comerford and pat and i spoke about it and it felt as though for the immediacy of the scene because it was a it was a big scene there were, there were lots of the major players and the dialogue had to be quite fast and it was quite reactive and um, and we asked JJ and he said, no, I'd like, I'd like you, I'd like you to do it for the rehearsal so we can find the rhythm of the, of the scene. And then obviously when we shoot it, yeah. Pat can, um, Pat can voice it. So yeah. So I found myself handling dialogue again and in quite a high pressured situation. Yeah. A little bit. And it's just a little bit. And, <laughs> you know, and I was there kind of, you know, trading lines with 
some of these, you know, really, really fantastic actors. And I thought, I thought, oh, okay, no, you know what? I can, I, I can do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you <laughs> no, can. I can, I can do this. You know, this is, I, you know, and it, and it was, it was a huge thing for me, I think, getting my confidence back. Um, and then after that, not too long after that, as part of the battle at Big Rock, Moke sort of sequence for one reason or another during the uh during the mocap template that we made for mm -hmm. the shoot that we ended up doing in ireland i played the dad in oh so so again so i was i was you know working with colin trevorrow and doing dialogue and it was yeah. again it was like oh yeah you know what i can do this i can do this and actually i enjoy doing this yeah when it's in an environment which is you oh know, totally uh it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be supportive but i think um it's that thing of like sink or swim you know and actually yeah. i respond having just told you that story about you know that situation in york that went wrong for many reasons but i've learned that actually i i i, I do work quite well in those high pressured situations like something in my brain just goes you got to do this you know yeah You've got to be wearing lenses where you mm -hmm. can't see very well, and you've got to swing a sword at Christian Slater's head. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And I didn't kill him, and I didn't. You didn't. <laughs> you tried though. You tried though. I could tell. Tried. That's intent. <laughs> I, I I always said that uh, it's easier when you don't have a choice. I think yeah, about that true. a lot. It's like when it right? really comes down to it, it's yeah. like. You do not have a choice. Therefore, you have to let go of that sort of trepidation because you don't have a choice. Here we go. We're go off the diving board. Yeah. You know? So we were talking about writing there, weren't we? I, I, I've side, I sidetracked us a little bit. Um, I have ADD, Tom. You think I know where we're going? <laughs> this, is this is beautiful, wonderful flow. We're just going to keep, it's going to, going to rise. This is your fourth time. And... You should know by now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is why I'm enjoying it so much. <laughs> um, but so 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 look, I owe you an apology because I haven't I haven't yet read no. this, read this read, read the script that you sent my way. Um, I sent you a script. When did I do that? You did. You did a little a little while ago. And I said, Oh, I said, don't worry about I, it. And I said, Hey, you know, it's probably better that I try and get this, to this sooner rather than later. And here we are, and it's later, and I'm apologizing. <laughs> for not, for not you know what? It. Past you knew because uh, uh, scrap the whole thing, started over from scratch. Oh, okay, you did. Yeah, which from a writing standpoint is very hard to do yeah wow and so what so if so what what took you in that what took you in that direction i just woke up one day and i was like you know what we're starting over completely just totally from the beginning because i'm trying to make something work that isn't working that's great and i've spent a year of my time messing up with this yeah but then within three days had a completely new script done yeah ready to go. you see that wild everything everything happens for everything happens for a reason and you know yeah. when you make sometimes when you make those um when you make those brave decisions, mm -hmm. you know, that's actually when the magic happens. It's like something kind of fires and, and, and yeah, you've had that block. You're like the second we, Oh, okay. The creativity is still all yeah. there. I'm just trying to fit it in something. It doesn't fit in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, and sometimes, um, sometimes it's, you, you know, I mean, this is something I learned. I learned this from, I don't know if I've told you the story, but um, years and years ago, and I think this would have been before, I think it probably was before Star Wars. I think um, we we did. There's at the Royal Albert Hall. They have the they have the proms. Have you do you know the proms? Have you heard of the proms? I don't think so. This kind of big orchestral thing tradition oh. happens at the Royal Albert Hall in in London, and um, they they have various different themes, and they decided that they wanted to do a Warhorse inspired prom. Definitely before Star Wars. I think it was, yeah, I think it was before Star Wars. And I was very lucky to get the opportunity to audition for this. And I got to be part of the Joey horse team for, nice. the, for the prom. And what was what was really lovely and what was special about that was that the author, Michael Morpurgo, who wrote War Horse, he mm -hmm. was quite an important part of that live performance. So he appeared at various points. Oh, cool. Because they wanted to weave kind of him into the narrative as well. So I found myself in uh, a rehearsal room on a daily basis with Michael. And Dude. I had just got back. It must have been after I'd come back from dinos, maybe. But I got back from uh, a process of of um, having written my first book for kids and had, oh, God, it was crazy. So, <laughs> so I was 
Uh, again, ADD. Here we go. Get yeah, ready. I feel you. You'll, 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 Helmets you'll, on. Get ready for this. Get ready for this. <laughs> so I was uh, seeing out my last month on the Warhorse production in the West End. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I was rehearsing the Walking with Dinosaurs arena oh, for yeah. the daytime. So I was staying in Acton where we were rehearsing get up, be at the venue, the rehearsal venue for maybe eight o'clock in the morning. And we'd, I'll be rehearsed through till five. And then I would jump on a tube and get my butt as quickly as I could in to, to the new London theater um, in central London to do the war horse show in the evening. And then it was eat, sleep, rave, repeat. And I was doing it all over again the next day. And and I did this for Dude. about a month and I was, I was absolutely ready to drop not only because of the hours but also just because of the physical you know doing the doing the horse show was physical yeah. in itself but then the daytime i was learning to sprint in these in these velociraptor costumes i mean it was it was bon but no that wasn't enough that wasn't <laughs> enough for me i i had decided that i got this idea for a kid's book the first one that i ever wrote and i'd had it kind of a few months prior to that i think walking across the, the bridge waterloo bridge to work and it, i'd had this idea and it was like great and i started to write it and i look back and i was i was so naive i'd written like <laughs> three chapters four chapters and of course i thought it was going to be the next harry potter and so i sent it off to a couple of literary agents and uh one of them got back to me fairly quickly and said, we really like it and we want to read the completed manuscript. <laughs> and I said, sure, I'm just doing a few tweaks and then I'll send it over to you. So, I totally have it right here. Right, it's, right, it's in my it's, pocket. It's literally, it's just, I've just, uh, oh, I just got a few, just a little, just, just give me like, uh, <laughs> I just got to find it, but it is totally it. done. <laughs> so, so then in between, it was honestly, Brian, it was, it was mental. So it, in between, any spare, you know, minute that I had between running around in a Velociraptor or charging around in a puppet horse, I was finishing, I was finishing this, this book. And so, of course, what I ended up sending off was oh, no. awful. Like it was all <laughs> over the place. Like it was, it was a mess. And <laughs> So I didn't hear, I didn't hear from, from the literary agent for a while. And then when I did, she said, oh, you know, I, it's, you know, the, I love the concept, but the writing, uh, you know. It's less it needs less dinosaurs. Work. It needs less, yeah, <laughs> less dinosaurs, <laughs> less horses and less dinosaurs. Yeah. And, and I was like, oh, okay, okay, I'll do a rewrite on it. So I went and rewrote it and sent it off again and waited. And, and then this this was when I was touring around um, Europe with the dino tour. And so I was like eagerly, you know, and then and eventually I got the response that, no, we're sorry. We're not going to, we're not going to go. Sure. I, you know, was, I was crushed because I spent all this time waiting. And I thought, well, you know, so anyway, so then I kind of sort of not moved on, but I was feeling really crushed by it. So I was like, right, okay, I'm going to focus on other things. And then I found myself in a rehearsal room with Michael Morpurgo. And I kind of plucked up the courage to kind of say to him on a tea break, I said, I've written this book for kids and you know i had some interest from this literary agent but she said the writing wasn't quite up and i've done some rewrites on it and i just i just i don't really know what to do now and he yeah. said he said well look he was very kind he said uh send it to there was a reader she's now she's now in her own right many years later she's now a very successful literary literary agent of, on her own but at the time i think she was a reader for the agency and he said i will contact her and i will say to expect your manuscript send it to her she can read it and she will give you an honest opinion as to whether or not you know she thinks maybe it's time to move on he said because sometimes he said you have to put it in the bottom drawer and move on Mm -hmm. And it's one of the hardest things to do. And Laura West very kindly read it for me and gave me some positive feedback, but said, yeah, you need to put this one in the drawer and move on. And yeah, I, I was, I was crushed for, 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 for a while. I didn't yeah. write, I didn't write again for maybe, I don't know, six months, but then slowly, but surely, you know, that part of the brain that, that, that mm -hmm. daydreams was, you know, it was all kind of collecting you know, things were sort of, and then, and that was Elflock. And then eventually that's when I sat down to write Elflock. 
um, which is what wow. was the next thing. That was the next thing that I wrote, um, which is not perfect. It's just the imagination, but I, but it's, I, I, I still, I have great affection for that book. Um, yeah. And I, and I, I love the characters and I think, you know, I think there's, I think there's potential there. Agreed. I really like what I heard. Thank you, thank you. Because you read chapters and you put them online. I, yeah. I, I listened to all of them twice. I was, I'm a big fan. Yeah. There's, there's one line that, even all these years later, that stuck with me, when uh, I for, I forget the main girl's name. The little yeah, girl. Maya. 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 When McKinney, Maya's yeah. when Henry gets taken, yes. off to the war, and she says they took my Henry. Yeah. That line years later is still in my head. I think about it every single time. Really. When I think of Elflock. I think about the cool creatures, but more importantly, that line, because it's uh, for anyone that has a sibling. Yeah. And like, granted, I had a brother who was in the army as well, my younger brother. So it's like, yes, that sentence rung so true. Yes. So it's like, no, no, that's that's my brother. Yeah. That's being that's going off. And yeah, this, I like it. I like it a lot. So Thank that's you. why I'm, that's why yeah. I'm going to ask. I yeah. need more of it. You didn't finish it on the videos, man. No, what's, I didn't. You're right. Up? And I should. I should go. Come on, and man. Also, because reading aloud, this is something that I've discovered. Uh, so reading aloud, it, reading reading your own work aloud is... Sure. Um, uh, I can't speak necessarily for screenplays mm -hmm. or, or even, you know, stage plays, really. But certainly what I found for the novel, the children's novels, is that for me, reading them aloud is a is a really good way of identifying those parts where I've got pacing issues or or oh. or the rhythm isn't quite there or you can just hear it because and it's something and again I think it's probably something to do with being an actor. You, mm -hmm. you just you kind of you hear it. You hear when it's not quite, you know, when it's not quite kind of firing. So I and then and then I heard so that is there's that thing reading aloud and then then at some point you know after after having written two or three more of these and still you know still not finding the literary agent and not getting the book deal and et cetera et cetera Yet. you know you start to ask yourself well you know why 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 are you doing it and and you start you start searching I think a little bit well I did I started searching a little bit for reasons as to why why I was still doing it because after all you know. It is in some ways, you know, it's it's creatively, it, it's my body of work. Yeah. Like a painter spends their life working on totally. variations on a theme. You know, this mm -hmm. this is this is this is my work, you know, and 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 does it does it matter necessarily that, that painting gets seen or not? Maybe, but maybe that's not. the question, right? Right? Artistically, <laughs> creatively. You know, mm -hmm. who are you doing it for? Are you doing it for yourself? Are you doing it for other people? Are you, you know, and then I heard Neil Gaiman talk about Coraline. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to sort of paraphrase and, and probably misremember exactly <laughs> what he said. That's all I do. But what, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what I, what I got from it, what I got from it was essentially he, he, uh, and this may not be, this may not be hundred percent accurate, but what I got for it, what, what I can remember was him saying something along the lines of, He'd started writing this book um, and then his literary agent or perhaps his publisher had said to him, because I said, you know, because it was a, it was a kind of a horror story, but it was a kid's mm -hmm. story. And they had said, this is unpublishable. We can't, you know, no, no one is going to want to read this. It's a horror story. And it's a, <laughs> and it's, and it's a kid's book. Like they, these, these two things don't go together. And sure. so he'd kind of gone, Oh, so he, so he put it in the bottom drawer and he'd moved on, but he's, but he, but he started writing it, I think for his, youngest daughter and then when his sorry his eldest daughter and then when his youngest daughter reached a certain age he suddenly thought oh if i if i don't write this thing now she she's going to be she's going to be too old for it and then all my daughters will be too old for this oh yeah so so he so he finished it and of course the rest the rest is history that's um, Coraline. <laughs> yeah yeah it's Coraline. brilliant <laughs> fantastic and of course there was a place for it you know yeah so it made me think about why why I was doing it. And ultimately I thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to start, I'm going to start reading my books to my boys as their, as their bedtime story, because then not only is it my work, my body of work that I'm continuing to build upon, it also has a meaning and a purpose. And actually, you know, if, if, if there are no other kids in the world that get to experience these stories, then, then actually 
this has been something very special for my boys because it was something that I've been able to give to them. And, and also it, it's really helpful. Um, <laughs> certainly Henry, my eldest is, he is, he is mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not. He's not mean. He's, he's just, he makes really, himself fall asleep it, yeah. as you're reading. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, he's very discerning. He's very discerning and he will, you know, either, midway through you know chapter <laughs> or at the end you know he'll he, you know he will he will give me some some really really good really good feedback and he'll ask questions and it makes me go ah uh, yeah so he'll ask a question see the great thing about it as well is that he'll ask a question and it does one of two things it either tells me that i am going in the right direction uh-huh. Because the question that he's asking is one that I've already thought about, and I'm deliberately wanting the reader at this point to ask this question because I'm going to answer that in the next paragraph or the next chapter or further down the storyline. But this is something that I'm aware of, and it's like, okay, ah, good. I'm glad you picked up on that because you're going to find out about that. Yeah. Or it's something that I've missed, and it's something that I go, ah, oh, okay, you know, ah. I hadn't even thought about that, but I totally see from Henry's perspective why his brain is asking that question. And it, and then you go, right, I've got to go back. And, you know, it's brilliant. So I stop and I make a little note in the margin and then I carry on reading. And also reading to them aloud, you, you particularly with dialogue and things, you just notice when something is a bit clunky or, mm -hmm. uh, or, or equally you, you, you notice when something flows really nicely and you think, oh, that's great. I really, I really enjoyed reading that. And you can tell when they went and because I'm enjoying it, they're enjoying listening to it. And it's, so it's this kind of, yeah, I mean, the benefits of reading aloud in that, in that respect have been, have been really ex an exciting discovery for me. How can it not be? And that's I I am yeah. the same way when I reread stuff because all I read is scripts, and when I reread them, a majority yeah. of the rewrites I'm doing is dialogue changes. So I'm like, he said that. What if I change this word to this? That sounds better, and it it yeah. comes out better. But yeah. I I have a buddy of mine who's a writer, and he's kind of like my brainstorming partner with anything that I do, and I'll send him drafts, yeah. and he'll just send me back questions. What does this mean? Why are they doing this? Blah blah. I'm like, oh right, okay, because it's in our heads but it doesn't yes. mean it translates onto the page. Yes. So then when you get all those questions, I should probably answer that. Yeah, let me put a word in here that means that this block because you're not in my head. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and, 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 and that redrafting, you know, you can get lost in that redrafting oh, yeah. process. Like, like you know, like I, I sometimes it gets to the point where I'm like, I just, I, th I think my head's going to explode because yeah. I'm, I, I don't know how many times I've redrafted the first three chapters, and then I, and then I come back, you know, and then maybe six months will go by, and then I'll, and then I'll come back to it, and I'll be like, right, yeah, I've had this new idea, brilliant. So then I change something in in chapter three, and then I, and then I think, oh goodness, have I, have I done the necessary kind of like now, and do I need to go back and change, and then, and then, but have I already done that, or was that that previous draft, or, and I just man it's like you know so when you get to like like when you get to like the i don't know like the brandon sanderson level of like you know like, yeah, oh my god <laughs> like there's one of him <laughs> and like storylines i just i just i mean you know i'm dealing most of the time i'm just dealing with with you know with one with one protagonist you know yeah. <laughs> uh in, in a relatively you know uh in a not you know not too tricky or complicated situation but i just think it just it must be anyway i mean he, he i mean he has teams he has teams of people and he's he's wired differently. Yeah, the dude wrote yes. five big time novels in quarantine. Five. Yeah. Five. Did you see? Did you see that announcement video he made? No. Dude, you gotta watch it. It's on YouTube. He talked about he promised two books in this thing, and, and in he, the video he's like, "Here's the first book. Here's the second book." But I was in quarantine, so you know, I wrote another one, and then I had some time, so I wrote two more, and I was like, "Dude, how?" He's just, you know what it is? He has some sort of matrix link in the back of his head where the universe yeah. just funnels. There's no yeah. way he thinks about these things. They just happen. He's in constant flow state. It's the only thing that makes sense. Wow. And there was, and there was me. There was me feeling proud of myself <laughs> that I, that I'd smashed out two books with, a, with an approximate <laughs> word count of like forty thousand or maybe fifty thousand each. You know, like <laughs> I mean, like you know. Uh, no. Feel proud, Tom, because I'm gonna read your books. Thank you. And if you're out the of, only one out of spite now, I'm not going to read his. <laughs> if you're the only one, then that's the that's I'm all. ride or die here. You know, I always say I don't have bail money, but I'll go to jail with you.
Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you you did mention swinging a sword at Christian Slater, which is another thing. Yeah. Who'd have thought? How so? How did this happen? Not only are you you worked on Willow, but yeah. dude, you're like a main character in an episode. It's good great, American it? accent. Yeah. Props. You helped me with an audition with a British accent. Yeah. You're American. Okay. Was it all right? Did it, did it, did it, did it pass muster? Dude, I didn't know it was you. Yes. Kid you not. When I got to the credits, I was like, what? Yes. Hold on. Because D looks like D. Yes, he does. I can tell right away. I'm like, that's yeah. D. I recognize yes. him right away. But you had no idea until it got to the credits. And I was like, that was Tom. And I went back. Flawless. Thank well you, Brian. Thank you. Well done. That's, you know, you're not. What's what's really lovely about the, the feedback that I've had for Saris is that, um, you know, there's, there, there's, there's a there's been a a handful of people who I who I love and respect who have all said this. They said they couldn't a they couldn't see me mm-hmm. under the under the makeup and b they weren't sure if it was my voice and I yeah and so I and mean, I can't take credit for the first one, um, and that's an interesting one because the 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 bust I'll so I'll I'll, I'll send you um I'll send you a link to um. Yeah, I think some. I think somewhere there's a picture in some of the BTS. I think of the of the bust for Saris uh, that was that was a sculpt, this beautiful sculpted bust that Martin Rezard did for the character, which is what the cat, you know, which what the the, the makeup was based on, mm-hmm. and it's really badass. But you can see you can see me in it. Oh, That's an interesting thing. You can see me under the un, you can see me within the sculpt. Sure, it's based on my head cast. Um, so I could see me within within that kind of maquette, that sculpted maquette. It's more a, it's more a bust than a maquette. It's a, it's a it's a huge thing. It's a it's, it's amazing. It's absolutely oh, stunning. Cool. But interestingly, when it came to the makeup application, th- there was definitely a discrepancy. Martin himself, who was applying, he was applying. He came along, multi talented Martin, not not just a fabulous sculptor, but he was also applying the you know the makeup for the multitude of, of trolls that we had. I mean, it was yeah. and that that in itself, you know, the, the troll factory, it was bonkers. You know, we had this this building within Dragon Studios that wasn't even properly finished. I don't, I don't think it even had running water. I don't know. It was, it was, <laughs> it was just, we had the top floor of this thing. It was a cave. It was a troll it was cave. cave. <laughs> I mean, it might as well have been the troll cave. It, uh, <laughs> we had like the top floor of it and it was... You know, within one room, there must have been, I don't know, seven, six or seven, maybe eight makeup stations. And it was just like a revolving Ooh. door. I mean, I mean, it's as close as, as, as I'll probably ever get to. And, and it's probably not even close to, you know, <laughs> those extraordinary kind of nights spent, you know, preparing the the orcs on on the Lord of the Rings. You, yeah. know, like, you know, the amount of kind of just the just the volume of um of supporting artists that were put into to prosthetic makeup but anyway we had we, you know we had there was a lot going on so martin was there helping to apply makeup and he came over um fantastic uh, liz and jen who, who were doing my doing my sort of hero application he came over and, and was just and was looking at it he was like ah it's interesting he's like i can't i can't i can't see you under it yeah like and i agreed I, I looked in the mirror and i thought no i can't i can't really see myself under there and i had a hint that i was going in the right direction with the accent because one of the ad's kind of the floor ad's um was american i think she was i think she was from california and during the filming process at some point she was kind of near us when we were kind of on a break between takes and i was talking to d and I think Ruby Cruz as well. I think Ruby was that was the scene where she's in the chair. She, we're, we're, we're talking. Uh-huh. As Ruby was there and D was there, and we were we were talking. And the A the A the A D went. What, what what hold on, hang on. What, what are you are you doing a uh, sorry are you doing a London, what are you doing with your uh, are you doing a mockney act what are you doing right now And I was like, <laughs> what? No no this is this is my voice. She was like what? She said what? You're not. She's like, you're not Californian. I was like, no, no, I'm, no, I'm from London. She's like, <laughs> she's like, what? Oh, oh, I could have, I could have sworn you were from California. And I was like, no, no, it's, it's an accent. And I, <laughs> so I was like, so, so that was, I got thought, him. Okay, good. Okay. That's, I, I, you know, that sort of gave me a little inkling that I was on, at least I was on to the right kind of, um, right, right track with that. Yeah. Maybe a little bit. How long were you in the chair? 
Yeah, it was a long one. Four, four to five hours, I think. Ooh. Yeah. Did it ever get shorter, or that was the shortest? Yeah, it did. It, it it did. I think we got it. I think we started getting it down to four, maybe maybe just under four. Ooh, um, good for them. I love hearing stories like that with makeup, like Drax from Guardians. It's like this started at three hours. We got it down to one and a half. I'm like, whoa! Yeah. It's like NASCAR drivers <laughs> just get it all in there. Yeah, and you do, you do. It's amazing. You, you do, you do. I mean, they are so they are so talented at what at what they do, yeah. and they also, um, they. Oh man, you know that if anybody, I mean, I don't know if anybody wants to, you know, I think pay respect to a makeup a prosthetic makeup artist or reward them in any way it would be to gift them some kind of sports therapy massage because <laughs> you know they Noted. are you yeah. know generally speaking you know you'll have one person on 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 your left and one person on your right and they're working on the left and right side of your face applying pieces oh. so they're and they're and they're hunched over in these really bent over kind of positions applying this stuff for hours at a time and you see them Ooh. frequently they have to stand up and they walk away from the chair and you can see them kind of stretching their back out and then they come back to it and they carry on it's 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 Ooh. brutal um Ooh. So, you know, and then there's that process of getting in, you know, you, you start to learn how the pieces go together and it gets a bit quicker because then you can kind of, you know, uh -huh. um, yeah. So it's like, like you say, it's like anything you, you, once you've done it a few times, you go, yeah, we, we're into this, we're into the swing of it. But it meant we, there were some early, there were some early starts, some early. Starts. Oh, I bet. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if I should tell you this. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you this. I feel, like, <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like I can, I feel like I can tell you this. Um, uh it's because this is one of the things, right? This is one of the things that, you know, people might be like, oh, you know, what is it? What is it like being an actor working in <laughs> aesthetic makeup? And you go and there I'm sure there are some things which people go, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, I, I, I would have I would have imagined that was something that was on their mind or I could imagine that's something that they, they were they were trying to contend with what you might not know is that there sometimes there are other things which 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 you know occupy your mind and <laughs> one of the big things for me um was that this co the cost the, the the suit the the foam latex suit that i was wearing which is obviously saris has this kind of bare chest mm -hmm. so it was a so it was a one piece it was a one piece suit that oh, i no. climbed into in the morning and then they you know, sealed up, and and and, and there was there was essentially I had an option. You know, D D's application was a bit quicker than mine because he he completely shaved his head, right? And all of that stuff was applied to his head directly. But I was given the option: Do you want to shave your head, or do you want to keep your hair? And I was like, Well, you know, I'm I, I'll I'll keep my hair. I wasn't <laughs> sure. feeling quite method enough to go <laughs> yeah. you know, to, to completely bick you know bick my bick my head. So for me, that meant that the neck, the 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 whole sort of uh, foam latex neck went up into this kind of skull cap that had a hole. Oh. So I had to kind of fit my head into this skull cap and then my face would peek through this, the hole and then they would seal. And then I'd, well, I'm sorry, I'd climb. So my, I, my legs would go in, I'd put my arms in and then my head would go through. And then once that was in, they would seal me up completely. And then they would start the process of applying the makeup and the makeup would go over my skin, but it would also go over the skull cap. So the whole thing was this kind of seamless piece. Gotcha. Okay. But what that meant oh no was that once the makeup went on i i could do a number i could do a number one i go for a pee <laughs> but uh but i couldn't i couldn't oh, no. do a number two and <laughs> so so i was like getting up at like one o'clock in the morning oh, no. to like get in a cab a car that would take us from the hotel to the studio so i'm getting up at a really unnatural time anyway <laughs> <Right. laughs> I'm, I'm without wanting to you know without wanting to, to reveal too much about me right? Right. No, I'm, a, I'm a pretty regular guy i'm a pretty i'm a pretty regular guy like for me it's pretty clockwork you know i go once in the morning i go once in the evening and life is good you know life is really good so <laughs> so I'm there at the hotel at like one o'clock in the morning, going like, 
Please. Please. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Come on. It's, it's, you know, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning. You're, you're not going to be able to do this. So you have to do it now. And of course, my body was like, it's one o'clock in the morning, dude. What are you thinking? <laughs> I'm not doing this now. No. <laughs> No, I, well, part of clockwork, you don't you understand? Yeah, yeah, you're messing, with, you're messing with the. This is like, you know, what are you doing here? You know, it's like, <laughs> and so, and 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 so, I, I, so I got, in, I got all up in my head with it, man. I really did. Like, I, <laughs> no. I was really, I was freaking out, and like, you know, I, I get in, I get in the chair, and they start putting makeup, and I'd be there, I'd be going, oh, but what if I need, what if I need to, oh my god, because they'd finish, they'd finish. Yeah, <laughs> they'd basically, they would finish the application. At about the time when I would normally be sitting down, <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, "This is oh, this is awful." So you know, I, I so I stopped. You know, I st I started limiting what I was eating the night before, That's and uh, and yeah, it became like it's and uh, yeah, it was so it's it's funny, isn't it? Because on top of all the other balls that I was juggling on that job, mm -hmm. um, that. <laughs> That was also that was also <laughs> on on my mind quite a lot, you know. Uh, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? And you know, the glamour so, of being an actor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I always say this. I, you know, I always say, you know, or the, or, you know, if I ever see, if I, if I ever, if I'm ever on set with an actor who's, you know, not wearing any prosthetic makeup and has a, you know, really easy costume and. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they're ever behaving badly, I just, I, just think, I just think you don't know how lucky you are. Right? You don't know how you could be. You you know you could have already been up for eight hours right. by this point, by unit call. You could have already been up for eight hours. You could and um, could now be wearing like a, a very large amount of prosthetic makeup mm -hmm. and having huge anxiety about needing a poo. So you know what? <laughs> just, uh... <laughs> so you know what? Just 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 be grateful that you're wearing a pair of trousers, my friend. That's yeah. Uh, you know? Check yourself. Yeah, check yourself. Because <laughs> you're able to. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, because you have the luxury, my friend. <laughs> you have the luxury. Did you? Did you? So I imagine you had to audition for Saris, right? How do you? How do you end up as Saris? Yeah, that's a, that's that's a that's a that's a story. That's a story in and of itself. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, it was an interesting one. It was. It was. It was not. It was. It was not. Not without its challenges, actually. I bet. Um, so. John, John John Kasdan, I believe, uh, asked for D because of the connection with Solo. Ah, makes sense. Um, and asked Neil for to recommend another, you know, another another sort of creature performer cool. to to be Saris. And so uh, Neil very kindly threw through my name in in the ring, and I had a meeting with John. And Wendy Miracle over Zoom. Cool. Where we discussed the character. But I didn't audition for Philippa Lothorpe, who was the director. Oh, nice. And so the so the first time that I met Philippa, and there was, you know, like like life was life was not on my side that morning because we were doing uh we had this fantastic I mean, you know, you very rarely get the luxury to do this, but but Derek, I was assisting Derek in running these uh, the troll movement boot camps. Oh yeah, cool, fantastic. Because we had you know a, a large number of supporting artists from from a local talent agency that were brought in to be to be the background trolls, and so we were you know we would sort of training them up and teaching them the creature moves. And then we also had lots of the core team from Neil Stable as well, who were also being more featured featured trolls in the episode. Um, so it was, it was fantastic. We had we had this. It was something like two weeks of of, oh, of, dude. of movement stuff, which you hardly ever. I mean, like I, I've certainly never been in a process like that. Um, but on the first day that I arrived, I I knew that Philippa was going to be. I knew that she was she was on the lot. I knew she was there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my agent had said that probably at some point she would want to meet with me to discuss the character. Um, uh, but my agent said to me, it won't be it won't be tomorrow. So, so don't worry about it. So I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> at that point, Classic. 
Yeah, classic, right? <laughs> that point i i i hadn't seen a script yet there wasn't there wasn't a script available for me for me to read for the character so we arrive we we start the we start the the the, the troll movement camp and and uh, in in another twist of fate um one of the security guards who checked me in in the morning um took my phone off of me and so we had to lock our phones in these locked boxes mm -hmm. which i gather is protocol for for supporting artists he didn't realize that i was one of the cast so oh. <laughs> because we were doing the troll stuff i think he thought i was one of the supporting so he so i and i didn't question it i just went hey here's my phone fine sure locked it away in a box and that was gone in the meantime so then we off we go we do our mornings kind of you know um movement camp and in the meantime, of course, my agent has been trying to get hold of me on my phone. To say, <laughs> uh, say you're having a rehearsal that afternoon with Philippa. Oh. So I'm having so I'm having lunch, uh, <laughs> and uh, one of the ads uh, appears and says, "Oh, um, here are your here are your sides for your for your meeting with with Philippa this afternoon." And I said, uh, "Sorry, sorry, what? Uh, <laughs> yes, you've got a you've got a meeting with Philip in about forty five minutes. Um, so um, yeah, if you just want to have a, I was like, thanks, thanks for that, great." <laughs> and Derek, Derek was very sweet. He just went, he went, dude, just just go in that corner. Just don't worry about it. We'll, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll deal with the rest of the stuff. You just you go in the corner and you just just read the script and do what you got to do. So I went to the corner. And, frantically and it was one of, and i think i think it was that it's saris's biggest scene it's one of the you know the I think it's first comes in and it's all of that dialogue with ruby and um and with warwick and and so i'm i'm you know i'm, I'm and at that point i didn't you see again at that point brian i i john and i had discussed the character um but i didn't i didn't know how featured he was i don't know how how much he had to say and so suddenly i'm looking at the script and i'm like okay, okay there's quite a lot i so oh god he says quite oh Oh, oh, it keeps oh my going. goodness there's quite a lot there and, oh and there's, there was like four or five sides and he was like heavily featured on all of them and i was like oh oh god oh no like this and so you know i'm, I'm desperately trying to sort of come up with with this uh with <laughs> with with this idea of a character and so i'm like okay yeah okay great okay and then and then the idea right okay time for the rehearsal so you know suddenly there i am and I, i'm i'm in a room with philippa and warwick and Ruby, Warwick and Ruby are there. And it's like, okay. And so I sit down, hello, make introductions. Hi, hi, hi. Yeah, I'm Tommy. Yeah, I'm been playing Saris. Okay, yeah. Um, and and Philip says, okay, let's uh let's go for it. Let's let's just go for one. And so we so we we did, and I and I chose uh originally I chose uh my first choice was to make him like a kind of old school English Hollywood baddie so he was kind of like this he was sort of sonic and kind of sinister sinister like that you know <laughs> and, um, and so <laughs> i did i did the read i did the read i did it finished and there was this there was this kind of hush in the room and then philippa who is lovely by the way and i get on really well with her and so, so, you know subsequently we we, we uh -huh. built, built a very strong relationship but philippa said Right, that's um, that's about as far away from what I imagine the character to be. Oh no! <laughs> and, I was, and I could see the look on Warwick's face. I could see the look on Ruby's face. And I thought, I'm being fired. This is this is it. This is it. <laughs> Have um, a good one. Walk out. Yep. I think I'll see myself out. Here's the door. Uh, thank you. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm sorry. Of, uh, and I think Philippa. So then I, 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 like, I don't know why, but this little kind of laugh came out of me because somewhere inside me, you know, there was a part of me that was sitting outside of this situation looking in and just found the whole thing really funny. <laughs> as awful as it seemed in the moment. It, it was quite funny. So this little kind of titter came out and it kind of caught Philippa and she went, oh, do you know what? I've just, I've just realized how that sounded. And I'm so sorry. I didn't mean it like that. It's just that, <laughs> it's just that I, it's just that I didn't cast you. And I thought, yeah, I thought that's a really, really good point. Essentially, you know, I have come in through the creature channel, uh -huh. you know, through through creature effects, and so you know, you're you're dealing with an unknown an unknown quantity here. Yeah. Anyway, it all worked out for the best. You know, we worked our way through it, and we and we and we got to a place where, obviously, you know, when 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 I'd had time, a little bit more time to. Sure. Uh, absorb what Sink was on in. The page. It was so clear that it that it that it was an American accent that was needed, and 
somewhere within that, you know, it became quite clear to me that it was John Malkovich, Malkovich esque, you know, uh -huh. quality to it. So, you know, so again, it all just, it all kind of, you know, it all kind of fell fell into place and um yeah and philip is fantastic and we had we had a great time on set and um uh cr you know creating saris and, and and bringing it to life and also you know john was you know hugely instrumental in in, in that too um uh yeah and and very hands-on and and created this extraordinary environment where where we we, we could sort of play and have fun and, and and find find the best in it and uh so yeah it all it all worked out for the best but i i you know i'm not I, I, <laughs> there's not there's not too much ego for me to say that you know there was definitely <laughs> a point in which i was like yep i've blown this uh, <laughs> a little know. bit of a learning curve Just a little, <laughs> little bit of a learning curve there <laughs> um so yeah but it's uh but no i mean it, yeah i'm i'm enormously i'm enormously proud of the work that that, that, that you we've should done be in it. um and uh yeah it was it was kind of it was intense and it was surreal um yeah it was really enjoyable it was also kind of terrifying at times um i bet it was sort of all it was all those things um the best things but, are yeah but the best things are aren't they yeah how much rehearsal did you have with the sword fight so we did yeah, CC CC and his team are absolutely brilliant. Um, so I spent quite a lot of time with with um, CC's son, George, and we. Uh, so we he taught me the choreography for the scene. George taught me the choreography for the scene, and then we did that a number of times. Actually, three, two, three, four times. We separate on separate occasions. We we ran through the choreography, and then obviously you know there was a fairly limited amount of time that christian was available for sure it was the day after he flew in or it might have, it might have even been the afternoon of the morning that he flew in he came straight to the stunt area and we began to rehearse the fight so then we did that a couple of times there and then we refreshed that when we when we got into actually shooting the scene but yeah as i alluded to earlier on there was an element of you know yeah the the, le the lenses were i wasn't blind but i certainly wasn't operating with the amount of vision that i would have liked to <laughs> while swinging a sword given that i was swinging a sword <laughs> at christian slater's face i was like mm -hmm, okay um but you know when you've got a really talented stunt team and, and choreography mm -hmm. team like that you know there are there are things that are built into it to make it really safe and then of sure. course you know what you what you learn is that it's all in the edit yeah you especially know? with action 100 right? mm -hmm. i mean you know you you see you, this isn't you know um, everyone knows this don't they about about sort of film fight choreography it it's it feels when you're doing it it feels really slow like yeah. you're like oh this feels really you know it's like ugh, ugh. <laughs> you know and it feels you're like wow this and then you and then you watch it back and it's like and that's and it's the edit isn't it it's just that you know it's, yeah. it's this incredible editing which makes it look as though it's happening really quickly and and everyone's like swinging their swords around really really fast but actually you know on the day yeah it doesn't it it, it feels a lot slower than you well you know so that's the thing stage combat real combat you know mm -hmm. you, i mean you you're yeah. you're a you're a sword master, aren't you? Uh, I you know, master is a strong word. <laughs> master, sorry, master. Is a word. You are you're 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 a disciple, aren't you? I'm a practitioner. Yes, you're a practitioner. Yes. Yeah, you're a practitioner of sword. Yeah. So you know, like you yeah. know, when you're swinging that katana around. Oh, uh, so different. Yeah. So different. So then, like, did you break any swords on set? Uh, n why? What What have you heard? I just like to assume things no, and see no, what I'm happens. Kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. Um, did I break any? I'm trying to think now. Did I break any swords? Anytime I see a sword fight, I'm like, there's no way they only did one. I think it's from watching the prequels behind the scenes. All the lightsabers are bent. Yeah. And I'm like, there's no way they only had yeah. one of these. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I feel like I am aware okay, of okay. some breaks just happening. I mean, you know, there was, there was a lot. I mean, that 
I mean, that sequence that CC choreographed had had four or five different fights happening simultaneously right. everywhere. You know, so when we did the master of that, you know, it was a it was full on. You know, you've got you've got stuff happening all around you. Um, and I I have a feeling that there might have been some breakages during during, you know, some of the initial um, that's bound to happen, isn't it? You know, that's, that's, it has to. You gotta break you gotta, a few eggs. Gotta break a few eggs. You gotta break a few swords. <laughs> yeah. At one point, I thought I was gonna have these. They had these. Some of the trolls had these. Um, had these kind of huge, like staff, like mace kind of things. Oh yeah. I, I was gonna. I was gonna have one of those. I thought I'm never gonna be able to swing that thing around. <laughs> you know, like pick it up and like fall over backwards. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it looked a lot of fun, and you did a really good job. It, Thank you, Brian. It was, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was it was it was a lot of fun. It was. Um the fight stuff could you know the fight stuff is it's 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 crazy, you know, like any 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 kid like us, you know, who grew up watching certain types of swashbuckling films. Mm -hmm. You know? Oh yeah. I'm not ashamed to say that 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 part of my brain that thinks of myself as a pirate or oh yeah or you know like <laughs> that continued that didn't stop when i when i you no, know when I, when i'm I still surrounded adult. by samurai like, that stuff just keep, that just keeps going like <laughs> yeah. so you know but but there was a you know i spent i spent huge amounts of my childhood you know we used to like oh my goodness like when we were kids we used to do this we used to get newspapers we'd get um we'd get all of the old sort of leftover newspapers out of the rubbish bin and we would like wrap them uh -huh. in, wrap them into these uh incredibly kind of solid um, <laughs> like lightsaber shapes yeah. essentially and then we would just get a load of tape and just go <laughs> around them and then we would just club each other mm -hmm. to death until yep. uh, either until you know uh, uh, you know one of our friends got injured or started crying or yep. or the or the or the sword basically began to fall apart you know 100 you know, like that was that was how i spent a lot of my <laughs> my childhood same <laughs> that and going that and going to army surplus like army surplus stores and buying camouflage jackets that were way too big for me and then, and then yeah. running around the woods pretending that i was like a commando you know <laughs> so, it, it, <laughs> so like so that you know so then then yeah so you fast forward to you fast forward to to being able to you know being able to kind of be involved in that kind of fight choreography with christian slater you know because yeah. that was the thing it's like this is you know like robin hood prince of thieves was he was one of my favorite, Come still is on. my favorite films you know you know he was will scarlet there's there's that you know there's the, you know and the, the, so there's, there's that oh, there's that link for me that goes it's like this goes right back to being a kid and, and watching that film for the first time and you know prince of thieves is like so I played, uh, you know, I played, I've been waiting to to play Prince of Thieves to my boys because I would suggest it periodically mm -hmm. and they would sort of, oh, no, no, I don't really fancy that. No, I don't really fancy that. And and I'd also, I'd also been kind of doing that with the Princess Bride. Ah, oh, there you go. And eventually one afternoon they were, they seemed to be kind of, they seemed to be, oh, okay, all right. Okay, we'll, 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 <laughs> we'll give that a go, daddy. We'll give, we'll give that a go. And of course, and I, you know, I, I was, I was waiting for, you know, the scene. Uh huh. And I, and I watched them, and the scene, you know, it starts, you know, and and y y yeah, and he got Montoya, and um, and uh, and Gary Elves are, uh, you know, going at it, and uh, and I watched them kind of like, sort of like they start, they, they were sort of like, and they started sort of sitting forward in the chairs, they were like. <laughs> now we didn't, we didn't, you know, we got halfway through that film, and we had to pause it. Because one of them had grabbed a broom and the other had grabbed something else, and and they were just <laughs> going at it, you know. They were, like, you know, and, and and it was like, and I was like, yes, you see, and I was like, that's that's my child, that's you know. There it and is. After that, they were like, they were like, uh, okay, so uh, so suddenly, suddenly, Prince of Thieves became. <laughs> what appealing. else you got? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly, and then and then yeah, you know, you know, 
after the same thing after that we finished that and they were they were yeah god they they yeah they they destroyed the living room <laughs> you know yeah. my brother and i were the same halfway through the fight you switch hands i forgot i was left-handed <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's such a good scene it's so, i think we um i think we i'm pretty sure we use that as a uh, drama school we use that as the template for one of the final kind of fight choreography certificate things that we had to do cool yeah i love that looking at the trajectory of your life as a kid being inspired yeah. by these movies fighting with newspapers yeah. to drama school to having that scene be a part of it to actually fighting christian slater it's like your whole life has led up to this scene yeah it's pretty cool yeah and you know what it is, it is probably i mean that probably was the last time that i picked that i picked up a practice sword would have been at drama school when we were, when we were using foils. Obviously, we were learning we were learning to fence. So that prop that probably was like trying to think because I don't think I did any. When I left drama school. Did I do any plays which required any sword fighting? No, I don't think so. And you know, pre pre Willow, I certainly haven't done any 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 film or television where I've been required to sword fight. So that's probably yeah, that's probably the, you know, like the first time of picking up like a practice sword since since drama school. So yeah. I love it. But it all comes back, doesn't it? It all Look comes back. That. You're like, oh, I remember this. It just feels right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Do you, at, at this point now, do you have any uh, any advice for anyone who's, you know, either going to get into a, a sword fight with Christian Slater or mm. just keep on the acting journey? Yeah, I think it's about keeping the faith. Yeah. I think it's about, you know, keep the faith. And, um, and and don't be afraid. So this goes back to everything that we've been talking about tonight, Brian. You know, keep the faith. Don't be afraid to put it in the bottom drawer and move on. You know, I had an inkling when I started out on this kind of weird, crazy kind of creature journey trajectory that I might at some point find my way coming back to acting and dialogue and 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 that the and that these two things might cross over mm -hmm. but I had been prepared to leave it all behind yeah. you know I had I had got to that point uh where and, and that's and that's one of the reasons why I went into doing puppetry in the first place yeah because I because I, I felt like for some reason the industry wasn't particularly interested in me as that yeah. as that thing sure it, you know i i and i didn't realize it at the time so one of the greatest compliments that that i ever received from a director that i worked with so i i did the first play that i did out of drama school i worked with this wonderful director called ted craig and it was a wonderful experience i i learned so much from him i learned so much from um, wonderful writer George Parsons and all of the fantastic cast that I worked with, and most of who, who most of them were much older than, than I was, you know, much more experienced as an actor. They, they, like, I learned so much from them, and it was a wonderful experience. And it was so much so, we all had such a great time. And this isn't, this isn't, you know, usual, but it was such a, a great experience for all of us that we we began doing these anniversary meals. So on the year that that, that we'd opened this play, we came back and we had. Uh, we had a meal together. We went to oh, cool. Um, the it's moved now. Actually, it disappeared for a while. But wonderful kind of actors restaurant called Joe Allen's in um, sure. In, in, which I think you know it was, originally it was a new it was a new it's a New York um, establishment. I think Joe Allen's. Huh. But for years it was uh, for years in London it was at a certain location and it was the it was like you know it's a place if you're an actor you went you know you can have dinner there and um we went there for this anniversary meal and things weren't things weren't going very well for me. You know, I, I wasn't, I was I, either, I wasn't getting the auditions or I was, but they weren't going my way. And I was really frustrated. And Ted had asked me, he said, how, how's it going? And I said, honestly, it's not going very well. I, I you know, I don't, I, I'm, I'm struggling a bit. And he said, he said, look, you know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one of the problems. He said, you're a, you're a character actor stuck in a leading man's body. Hmm. And it didn't resonate with me at the time. Sure. At the time, at the time you know, that young actor, that ego, I was like, oh yeah, whatever, you know, like, you know, <laughs> like, but I, you know, I, but I want to be the leading man. I want to, you know, I want to be, you know, I want to be Legolas. I want to be Orlando Bloom. I want to be, you know, sure. uh, getting, you know, I, I had the curly long hair. I, you know, <laughs> straight out, you know, every, I was going into these casting rooms and they were saying to me, they were saying, oh, you, 
wow, you, you, you know, you, you're, you're like, you're like Orlando Bloom's younger brother. You know, they were saying all, I was getting all this stuff. And I was like, yes, I'm, ah, you know, so when Ted <laughs> said that to me, you know, I, I, it was almost like I took it as, um, it was almost like I, not, not an insult, but it, but, but it, it just made me more frustrated. And, and I, I, I'm now through the prism of time, I'm able to look back on that, on that very kind comment that, or, comment that he made and see that it was a that actually it was it was one of the it was one of the nicest things that anyone's ever said about my acting yeah and so yeah so actually looking the way i look there's every there's every chance that 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 you know if there'd been a casting process for saris i wouldn't have got any well i wouldn't have got anywhere near it good point I have no, I, I, you know, what have I, what have, what have I got to my name? What have I got to my CV? What have I, what have I got to get me in the room to do, to do something like that? I, I don't, I don't, I, I nothing. I was unbelievably lucky, and that's not to say that I don't deserve it. Sure, but part of that, the success of that character is the way that he looks. Right. So I look back now and I'm able to see that that's a that's a great compliment. And actually to be able to go on this journey of creatures has a, has allowed me to come to come back to something that I that I love. And it's and it's allowed me to play a role like Saris, which I probably never would have been cast in. Right. If it hadn't been for the for the makeup. And it's allowed me to demonstrate that I can do that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, you can say, you know, I could. Because, you know, I always suspected that I could do that kind of stuff, but you don't really know. Oh, that's a fact. And, yeah. You don't know till you know. You don't know till you know. And, 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 and that, that, that anxiety that we're talking about with the writing, that's just, as, that's, you know, God, it's just as strong as an actor, you know, mm-hmm. that sense of, you know, I can't, I can't do this or I'm not right for this thing. Yeah. Um, so weirdly, I, I, found, I found my way back back to it um and it's and it's been through it's been through the creatures so it's funny isn't it like i i I kind of feel like there's there's something in that isn't there like there's some you just have to keep moving because you don't know when that road is going to cross but you're now you're never going to reach that road if you give up Keep, keep the faith keep the faith and yeah and and understand that a lot of these things are out of your hands they're out of your hands aren't all they? of them <laughs> you know it's so little that we can control and it sucks <laughs> yeah just yeah. i mean just like you know even even down to me telling you about that morning that i arrived at dragon studios and they took my phone away from me and then suddenly i found myself in a room with Philippa, and you know there is there is so much there's so much that you that you can't that you can't control you got to get on the ride you got to get yes yeah yeah yeah. but you got to you got to yes you got to be in it to win it you know yeah yeah. So, so, so keep the faith and don't, don't be afraid to put things in the bottom drawer and, uh, and move on because there's probably a reason, you know, there was a, there was a reason, there was a reason why back then in my mid twenties, there was a reason why something wasn't quite working. You know, this, this, the, the jigsaw puzzle wasn't quite fitting together. And I'm, and I'm not suggesting that it's fitting together now, <laughs> but you know, Timing. But but I certainly feel like I'm in a I'm in a much health my my relationship to acting yeah is in a much healthier place and I feel like because of all of this fantastic creature work and puppetry stuff that I can do yeah I feel like I'm in a place where I can honor that thing that Jim Carrey talks about which is this idea that these jobs are out there searching for you yeah rather. Uh, Rather than you know you as the actor desperately kind of like hunting for these for these jobs, I I, I now feel like I'm very lucky in the in that I have reached a place. And when I say luck, I don't mean in regards to having gained any kind of notoriety or success. But what I mean is that I'm in a position that it's not the be all and end all for me. I'm not going to die if I don't you know like if 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 an, if another acting role never comes along, well then maybe that's maybe that's fine. That's that. You know, but if something does come my way, I want it to be interesting and I want it to be exciting and I want it to be something that is worth doing for any myriad of the reasons that these things are worth are worth doing, not just because I'm an actor who's desperate to work. Yeah. Which is where I was, you know, so I mean I, you know, I did some I did some horrendous jobs <laughs> in my twenties, you know, acting roles, which which weren't, you know, the, the 
either the writing was not very good or I was not very good in it, you know. Been there, uh, been there. <laughs> yeah, right, you know, and you, <laughs> we, we all do we all do these things. It's part of that's part of the step, you know, you you, yes. you have to you know, you have to climb this is part of the ladder that you climb uh -huh. to get to where you get to. But you know, I I I don't feel like I I don't feel like I need to, you know, if someone comes along to me now and says <laughs> which is again probably quite unlikely that someone <laughs> comes to me and says hey tom we would like you to play this role where we see your face you know yeah. like, <laughs> like i look at some of the parts that i see on some of the tv series and i think oh you know now that i have saris under my belt oh, i want you know i wonder could you know would would a casting director consider me for this role or would they consider me? but then i look at some of these roles and i think they're not interesting to me yeah they're not remarkable in regards to to what they are putting out there and in, into you know the they don't light your fire yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah i don't know yeah perhaps that sounds perhaps that sounds a little... but that's what the artist is right if you you need to make art that inspires you because that's how you get the inspired performance otherwise it's flat and you're like i'm just not interested in that and not everyone has to be interested in everything no a hundred percent brian and also I can't tell you how lucky I feel to have been able to play a character like Saris where even when we were filming it, I knew, I knew it was on the edge. Yeah. You know, I knew that this, that this character was going to be chalk and cheese that, that there, you know, like I, like I was, I was ready. This is the thing. I was, the episode came out, you know, I went onto, you know, to YouTube and I enjoyed, I enjoyed watching all these amazing, you know, YouTube critique videos of sure going what what is going on with that <laughs> stupid troll <laughs> what, like what you know like just absolutely tearing into you know saris and the performance and everything and i and i you know and i sort of yeah and i enjoyed that i i, I enjoyed it because it was like yeah that's yeah when you're when you're when you're on the edge, when uh -huh. you're, you know, when you, you know, you know that it can go one way or the other, mm -hmm. then it feels like it's something that's worth, that's worth doing. Yeah. Well, I think Brian Cranston once said that the worst thing an actor can do is to move an audience to nothing. Yeah. It's like you just want, if they're angry, if they're sad, if they're happy, that's any of those is equally great. You just want them to feel something. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I've learned, and again, that's one of the things like even going and watching things, you know, I think as a, as a sort of frustrated, you know, young actor, I would go and watch things and I would often get really angry about certain things and angry about this and angry about that. And, you know, and I'm able to look back now and see that that's probably because that was a really good piece of art that was actually pushing, pushing buttons. Yeah. I just and at the time I just I just got it totally wrong, you know. I was there, yeah. <laughs> that's really rubbish, you know. And actually, no, it was, I, you know. So you you live you live and you learn. Like I I love that I've learned over almost two hundred episodes that luck is preparation meets opportunity. Yes. And all this preparation has happened, and I could not be happier for you. Yes. I'm so excited. Ah. Oh. That being said, Tom, we've been talking for almost two hours. I know. I know. You did it again. I'm you boob four sorry. times. <laughs> now, bef before I release you back into the wild, because you know I could talk yes. to you forever, where can people find you online? Where can they find your stuff? Talk to me. So I am still occasionally putting out inane content on, <laughs> by content I mean just words, on, <laughs> to, on to Twitter, at uh, Tom K. Wilton. Um, I've even taken the step to sort of say that i'm an actor now there you go <laughs> you know about I mean? time no i'm like i'm like hey i feel like I, I feel i can say that now yeah you can um yeah and uh what can i say about projects that are coming up that are coming out i can't say too much um working on some exciting stuff there's some really exciting stuff in the pipeline um and there are lots of things that are coming out pretty soon i think yeah which um which you know i was involved in in, in one way or another but it's that kind of thing where I, you know, I can, I'll, I can let you know and I can let you know. Dude, this was so fun. I appreciate you so much. Eh?
Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter and Instagram. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. There you'll find my demos, short films, and a bunch of other really fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to pick you up some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly and get early releases of the show, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Daryl, Daz, Ben, and Chris. Your support means so much to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.